good morning. Welcome to Gladeville United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. The choir will bring us into worship. hymn this morning is oh god our help in ages past please stand as we sing Our responsive reading this morning is Psalm 124. Barbara is going to lead us in this. Please respond in the bold print. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when foes rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then the raging waters would have gone over us. 
Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowls. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. be seated please so we get ready to go to God in, in prayer um, I want to remind you that the entire worship service is is worship and prayer when we lift our hearts to God when we listen to the word when we listen to God speak to us that is indeed prayer so this morning as we go into corporate prayer, we, we go into pastoral prayer, just kind of settle down. Breathe in all the things that the God has for us this morning, beautiful morning. And breathe out all the things that we need to let go of. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love and your mercy and grace. We thank you, Lord, that you have put us in this place at this time. And Lord, we know that you have, you have for us things that, that we need to do. We, we do not all have have all the same gifts and graces, but we all have gifts and graces and they're all needed. This morning, Lord, as, as we, we woke up and we moved around and we got ready and coming to church, Lord, uh, my heart had a, had a special place for those who were dealing with horrible weather and their homes destroyed and their, their lives never being the same again. And it made me think, Lord, that there are, in the blink of an eye, our lives might never be the same again. And not just because of disasters or not just because of, of death or just because of a car wreck or whatever. But Lord, there are times when our lives will never be again, same again because of the leading of the Holy Spirit. When we have opened our hearts and we see and finally that ah oh, moment comes to us when we either accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior the first time or we renew ourselves to him. And Lord, some weeks I have to renew myself to you a lot. But when that moment comes, our lives will never be the same. We thank you for that. This morning we lift up to you those who need a healing touch. First physically, and we think of Demi and Lacey, and We think of all the others whose names have been mentioned here this morning and, and whose names are just close in our hearts, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you extend your healing touch. And, and I know that healing comes in a lot of ways, that sometimes the greatest healing there is is, is to leave this world and and go to spend eternity with you. Oh my goodness, that is a healing. But then there are those who, who need emotional healings. 
we all know those people and sometimes that those people are us where where life just batters us that emotionally we are crushed emotionally we are we are hurt and emotionally lord sometimes we just need you to to just touch and heal us and, and lift us up and so as we think about those names this morning, we ask, Lord, that you hear our prayers. And then spiritually, oh, for our sin-sick souls. Lord, touch us and heal us, lift us up. I told somebody this morning, sometimes it's hard for me to see, to see people as God sees them. But this morning, Lord, spiritually, let us do a little better at that. But no matter what is said, no matter what is done, even though how hurtful it may be, Lord, spiritually, when we walk in your path and we walk so close to you that the dust from your sandals just covers us, and we're so close that we can hear you whispering to us, and that you hear our whispers and read our hearts. Thank you. Lord, this morning we, we, we lift to you the prayer that we have learned, some of us as we children, some of us later on, and some of us just, just pray it from our hearts as we say our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We've come to the time in our service where we give back to God a, a very little portion of what he has given to us with our gifts and our tithes and our offerings if our ushers would come. Please stand for the doxology. <coughs>
choir. That is my son's favorite song. Thank you all for singing it this morning. This morning we have, um, we are in the book of Esther. And there are, are two different scriptures. Uh, the first is Esther 7, 1 through 10. And then the next is um, Esther 9, 20 through 22. Barbara is going to be our scripture reader this morning. So the king and Haman went to the Queen Esther's banquet, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half of the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, an adversary and an enemy, the vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the garden palace. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned home from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in this house? As soon as the word left king's, the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending with the king, said, A pole reaching to the height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole that he had set up for Mordecai. The king's fury subsided. Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all of the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy, their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, this morning, just Lord, this morning, give me the words. Amen. So, this is strange. I love this story. Esther is one of the best stories ever. Last night, um, Barbara sent me a, a text and she said, are you sure this is right? That Haman is supposed to be impaled on this pole? Well, yes, this is. This is how the story goes. Sometimes it takes you by surprise and you, you get a phone call or, or maybe somebody shows up at your door unannounced and you can tell by the tone of their voice that something is very different. Have you got a minute, they say? Can I talk to you about something? And you say, yes, of course. Why don't we sit down? Your heart kind of misses a, a beat because you feel the intensity of this moment. And within a few seconds, a, a, a new reality unfolds. Something deep inside your stomach starts to tell you, this conversation is going to shape the rest of my life. This news is going to affect me in a different way to the way that it affects anyone else. And I imagine that that's 
kind of how it was with Esther when she got the message from her cousin Mor Mordecai about what was happening. They were living in Susa, one of the four capitals in the great Persian Empire. It was 475 years before Jesus was born. A hundred years previously, if you remember, the Jew, Jewish people had been overrun by the Chaldeans and taken into exile in Babylonia. Fifty years later, Babylon was conquered, conquered by the Persians and the Jews were allowed to, to return home if they wanted to. Some of them did, but some of them chose to stay where they were because they had discovered something very important. That God didn't just live in the land of Israel, that God was here too. God was everywhere. And Mordecai and Esther were, the, were among those Jews that, that, that stayed. But living as a Jew in the heart of the Persian Empire was a risky business. And this is the whole story about Esther, a big part of it. Straight away, we meet King Xerxes, other known as Ahasuerus in this story. And we find that he is the most powerful man in the whole world. But he also tends to be manipulative and easy manipulated. He's reckless. He's extrav extravagant. And once that he, he makes a law and it is on the books, that law can't be changed, even if it turns out to be a disaster. He was a mess. And this king is so absent-minded that even when Mordecai saves his life, and just read the whole story, he has forgotten all about it. Not only do the Jews live under an unreliable monarch and an unworkable legislative system, they also have sworn enemies. And one of the Jewish, the Jews' sworn enemies is a man named Haman. Haman and Mordecai, that's Esther's cousin, despise each other. And when Haman gets appointed to the post of prime minister, Mordecai riles him up so much that he manipulates, that Haman manipulates the king into issuing a decree that will wipe out all the Jews in the empire, all of them. So you need to remember that Israel is part of the Persian Empire at this time. So, if all the Jews get wiped out, then that eliminates the Jews from history altogether. And there's only one faint hope for the Jews, one tiny thread that is holding them from the abyss. Five years before the passing of this decree, Mordecai's cousin, an adopted daughter, Esther, without revealing her ethnicity, had joined part of the king's harem, undergoing a year-long grooming process to prepare for her one-night stand with the king. And the king liked her so much that he made her the queen. Now, you got to go back and read what happened to the first queen, Vashti, because that's a, that's a good story, too. But being queen did not give Esther the automatic intimacy with the king that one might imagine. The king still had his harem. And no one got to address the king unless he took his fancy and he, he waved his golden scepter at them. And if he raised his golden scepter at them, then they could approach him. If you tried to approach him and he hadn't waved his golden scepter at you, then you'd be put to, get, to death. And that happened if you were the queen or if you weren't the queen. 
So here we have Esther in the middle of a mess. But she doesn't know it's a mess yet till Mordecai tells her about the catastrophe and all this decree. And he somehow, think about this, he somehow fails to, to tell her that the decree came about partly because of his mindless stubbornness in anger in Haman. He didn't tell her that part. But he does say, now look, Esther, you're the only one who can do anything about this. That moment where Esther feels her, the stomach muscles tighten and her, her breath's getting shorter and, and she tries to escape and she says, but you don't realize that if I approach the king without him waving his scepter at me, that I'm dead meat. You don't understand it, Mordecai. Mordecai says, well, what makes you think that you're going to survive this massacre? Being the queen ain't going to help you a bit because you are a Jew. And if you keep silent and do nothing at this moment, God will eventually turn this whole thing around because the Jews are his chosen people, but you and I will not be here because we will be dead. Then he says to her, maybe this is exactly why you became queen. You thought it was saving yourself, but God thought it was for saving his people. Maybe God, and listen to this, maybe God puts you here exactly this moment for just a time as this. What does Esther do at this decisive moment? She stops denying, stops ignoring, stops making excuses, and stops running away. She realizes this needs more than just her own strength, so she asks the people, her people, calls on the Jews to fast and pray with her. She resolves that she is going to face up to the responsibility and go to the king with his great wobbly scepter. She recognizes that what she must do include disclosing her true identity as a Jew. And she simply says, I'll do this. And if I perish, I perish. She goes to the heart of the empire to save the Jewish people. Now we know the end of the story. Esther does save her people. She does so because she is stirred to an act of extraordinary fortitude. She does so because she strings Xerxes along until he's put her in her seductive hand. She does so because of a benevolent turn of events that triggered by the, the king's insomnia. And she does so because Haman's outside ego and his hostility to Mordecai obscure his political judgment. In other words, to pull this off, Esther acquires a mixture of courage and charm and luck, and the king issues a new decree that enables the Jews to live another day. That's basically the story. And as I read it again a couple of weeks ago, and I read it again, I think that there are a number of general lessons for us in this story. It teaches us that under arbitrary authority, it's dangerous for everybody, especially women and minority ethnic groups. It teaches us that power is not simply an all or nothing thing. Esther is queen and still is vulnerable. She is a Jew and yet she can marry the most powerful man in the world. 
and she is unaware that she is shortly to be executed. Yet she wraps the king around her little finger using those exquisite senses of, of timing and her insight into human nature and her, her beauty and her sexual expertise. But at the heart of this story lies those echoing words which I hope make your stomach tighten and your breath falter just as if Mordecai were speaking to you this morning. Perhaps you have come to this place, to this moment, to these people, to this challenge for just a time as this. I want you to think about Esther. She had some things, you know, she, but she lacked other things. She had beauty. She had that certain training. She had an ambitious cousin. She had a very powerful husband. But she didn't have any power over her own life. She didn't have any security in the face of those who planned to kill her and her people. And she really didn't have any personal intimacy with her husband. Think about Esther. And then think about yourselves. You have some things and you lack in others. Think about yourself. What you uniquely have and what you uniquely lack. And then think about where you're sitting. Think about the ways you feel powerless. Think about what our church needs and what the United Methodist Church needs or what the world needs. Think about the number of times that you have thought that there was nothing or no one that could do anything about the chaos in the world or in your life or in the church or in the community. And then feel, hear the exasperating man Mordecai tap on your shoulder and say, perhaps you have been given these skills and experiences, these privileges and, and, and deprivilization, so that just at this moment, you could do what nobody else could do, and you could do what no one else could be. God made you as you are because he wanted someone just like you. And maybe all this happened when you came here today and God sent you to this church at this time for such a time as this. And think again about Esther. She didn't have it all easy. And I know you don't either, but you do have some real gifts. She embarked on this long period of training and preparation. She didn't understand that, but she, she knew she had to do it. Maybe that's how you feel right now. You just don't understand all this. She found herself in a crucial moment, not a moment for sudden action right now, but a moment that she realized the rest of her life must be given to one cause. And in spite of her own safety, her own privilege, her own status, she was called for a time such as that. You could call it, I call it a moment of conversion. And what was she converted to was a, a full, a further time of preparation, of fasting, of planning, of biding her time, of waiting until it was worth taking an enormous risk and then executing a careful plan. And perhaps most curious of all for me, the person who brought her face to face with her destiny was certainly no saint. It was Mordecai. 
her stubborn, her proud, her scheming cousin who done a whole lot to put his people in this mess in the first place and expected Esther to dig him out. So maybe this morning you're thinking like I've been thinking for a very long time about this mess with the church. And it isn't about me. Sometimes I think that. This isn't about me. This is about all those other people who make decisions. Maybe if you feel like you're getting on in years and you're thinking, well, I made all those big decisions a long time ago. It doesn't matter where I stand on any issue. Because watch out. Because here comes Mordecai. Not an easy character. Not a role model. But nonetheless, speaking the truth. And he says, look back at all those parts of your story that make you unique, especially those events that felt like setbacks at the time. But you're now vital. Look at who you are. Look at the position you're in now, not obsessing about what it's not, but seeing the unique opportunity you have. And look at those massive challenges that are facing us. Perhaps God has put you right here, right now, for this moment, just for a time as this. And Esther listened. And without Esther, there would be no Jesus, because without Esther, there wouldn't have been any Jews. So this morning I'm asking you, will you please listen? Will you do what Esther did? Realize the reality of your situation. Seek all the help you need. Plan carefully, fast, and pray, and put yourselves in the hands of God. Because God has put you right here, right now, just for a time as this. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Touch our hearts, our souls, our spirits. Just let us turn to you. Amen. Our hymn of fence sending forth is this morning, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. We're going to sing verse 1, 2, 3, 5. Please stand.
up for the benediction, go in peace and love. And remember that this week, God is speaking to you. Amen. <laughs>